Good afternoon, everybody who have joined us on this specific session, which is related to COVID-19 infection associated thromboembolism. My name is Dr. Ravi. I'm the head of established product for Malaysia and Singapore based in Sanofi. And together we have three uh, speakers with us who will take us through this session. To give you the more details about this session, I think uh, I will invite the moderator for the entire session, Dr. Jensen. And to introduce Dr. Jensen, I will just say the few lines, Dr. Jensen, uh, I, although in this Congress context, I don't think he needs an introduction in detail, but it's my privilege to introduce him. Dr. Jensen is a consultant anesthesiologist and intensivist with the Department of Anesthesiology, Intensive Care and Pain Medicine at TTSH Hospital, Singapore. And now he's playing a very, very active role in the Society of Intensive Care Medicine, Singapore, and was the chair of scientific committee of the sixth SGM6 Intensive Care Forum in Singapore, and he is the organizing chair of the 7th SGM6 Intensive Care Forum and the first Asia-Pacific Intensive Care Forum. So without further ado, to take us through the details and to take the session forward, may I request Dr. Jensen. Dr. Jensen, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ravi, for your very kind introduction and uh, welcome everybody to Track 9, uh, which is kindly sponsored by Sanofi. Today, we'll be discussing uh, venous thromboembolism or VTEs and anticoagulation in the ICU. Um, by itself, a very challenging topic, but uh, should we do more in the ICU in the COVID-19 era? Um, so before I introduce our speakers, um, let me just quickly point out that you may key in your questions, if you have any questions, on the Q&A function of your Zoom screen. And we will try to address your questions at the end of the session. And to help us navigate the issue of venous thromboembolism in the ICU, we are very privileged today to have two hematologists with very keen research interests into COVID-19 coagulopathy. First off, we have uh, doc Dr. Yap Eng Su. Dr. Yap obtained his undergraduate medical degree from the National University of Singapore before obtaining his master in internal medicine in Singapore and also the membership from the Royal College of Physicians, United Kingdom. He then completed his advanced specialist training in hematology and went on to get his fellowship from the Royal College of Pathologists Hematology while pursuing a side interest in epidemiology and statistics as a researcher at the Department of Epidemiology, Leiden University Medical Center in Netherlands. His research interests include coagulopathy in trauma, epidemiological links between arterial and venous thrombosis, and in medical education. He is actively involved in undergraduate and postgraduate medical education and is currently a core faculty member of the Medicine Residency Program at the National University of Singapore, uh, National University Hospital. And then uh, he's also a, a assistant professor at the Yong Lulin School of Medicine at the National University of Singapore. Um, Ing Su, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, for your kind introduction. All right, I'm sharing my slides right now. So today I've been given the task of uh, sharing with everybody the VTE prophylaxis in ICU during uh, this during peacetime and how it has changed with COVID-19. So these are just my disclosures. And um, so just an overview of the talk, I'll be first talking about what's the evidence for VTE prophylaxis in ICU during the peacetime, which is currently uh, what most of us do. Finally, there's a huge large of literature that has come out since the COVID has come upon us. And what does the study say? So I'll try to summarize all the studies that have been published on it. And finally, the role of thromboprophylaxis for COVID-19 patients in ICU. So what I'll be doing is I'll be summarizing all the guidelines that have been published by various societies and of course organizations in the world uh, in this. And I'll try when we try to get some guidance from them on how we should do or how we should thromboprophylax uh, these patients and whether there's a need for increased thromboprophylaxis in the COVID-19 patients. So without further ado, let's jump straight in into the talk. So all of us know that VTE prophylaxis is very important in the critically ill patients. In the literature, it's reported that 13 to 30 percent of the in the Western population. In the Asian studies, that seems to be a bit a little bit lower, 6.5 percent to 10.5 percent. 
because of this high rates of VTE uh, in these critically ill patients, thromboprophylaxis is needed. So what is the evidence behind it? So in this slide, I just summarized the known studies already in patients, heparin versus placebo. You can see there are four studies that have been, that has usually been quoted about it. You use unfractionated heparin versus placebo, and you can see that if you use, uh, if you do not use any uh, prophylaxis, you have a rate about hitting about 30% incidence of DV DVTs. And then if you give unfractionated heparin or low molecular heparin, your rate will drop to about 11 to 15 percent and this is significantly so and based on and because of this a meta-analysis has also been conducted on this study and if you look at the meta-analysis using these trials it shows that it favors uh, more low microwave heparin or heparins for patients with um, to prevent VTE and in terms of major bleeding and ICU mortality they are equivalent all right so based on this is that um, Based on this, you actually can show that unfractionated heparin or low molecular heparin compared to placebo, there is definitely a significant lower risk of DVT. There is no difference in the risk of major bleeding. But however, the trials are not powered to detect a large difference in rates. So, but oh, nonetheless, this has led to the ACCP or the American College of Chest Physicians to recommend in 2012 that, that chemoprophylaxis should be given with all critically ill patients. So what about unfractionated heparin versus low molecular heparin? So there have been three uh, studies of which the biggest study is the PROTECT trial, which I'm sure the audience will be very familiar with. This is low molecular heparin, which use, they use delta parent versus unfractionated heparin. And you can see that actually low molecular heparin, if you look at the redu reduction in the risk of DVT, is as good as that of unfractionated heparin. So a meta-analysis has also been conducted on this, and it actually shows that low molecular heparin versus unfractionated heparin. It helps in preventing the DVT, maybe favoring a bit more towards the low mole. What about pulmonary embolism? This is where it differs. In the, unfractionate, in the low mole, actually it shows that pulmonary embolism and symptomatic pulmonary embolism favors that more of low molecular heparin. So low molecular heparin may be more effective in this. And in terms of major bleeding and ICU mortality, it's exactly the same. So henceforth, low molecular heparin is not associated with a low risk of DVT when compared to unfractionated heparin. There's no difference in DVT major bleeding or ICU, but it's associated with reduction in asymptomatic PE and symptomatic PE. And of course, you know that low mode is so much more easier to use compared to unfractionated heparin, and the absorption is pretty constant. So low mode has come into the forefront of prophylaxis in ICU patients. What about DOEX? There have been a lot of uh, talk and excitement over DOEX, and there have been two major studies that have been doing the Magellan trial for rivaroxaban, and of course the ADOPT trial for apixaban, and these have been looked in. But, and unfortunately, they failed to demonstrate any net benefit of DOEX in low like we have been. Moreover, they need their oral, so in your patients who are critically ill, it's a bit difficult to feed them oral, oral agents. They're renally cleared. In ICU patients, they may be very sick. They may be on renal replacement therapy, which makes giving DOEX very difficult to use. Henceforth, there's little or no role of DOEX in critically ill patients at this point in time. What about mechanical prophylaxis? I'll just be talking about this very briefly. There's use of graduated compression stockings and intermediate pneumatic compression devices. And there is evidence for that as well. In this slide, it shows you that three studies that looked into the use of intermittent um, cuff compressors in ICU patients. And it shows that actually it does reduce the amount of um, deep vein thrombosis or PEs in patients. Henceforth, if your patient is not able to have any chemoprophylaxis, mechanical prophylaxis is, of course, a, a viable option. So all this evidence has finally led to a pathway that we are very familiar with. Patients admitted to ICU or surgical, whether it be surgical or medical, consider the bleeding risk. If the patient has high bleeding risk or, or there is contraindication to anticoagulant, you give them chemical mechanical prophylaxis. And those who are not at high bleeding risk, then you consider giving them unfractionated heparin or low, low molecular heparin. And the evidence is pretty robust for this.
So what about COVID-19 and thrombosis? So we now know that critically ill patients and there have been a lot of studies that came out and newspaper articles and interest that COVID-19 patients seem to have more thrombosis than that of normal patients without COVID-19. And is this true? So let me summarize the evidence that has come out so far. So most of the trials that have been published so far are in patients admitted in the very early days of the COVID-19, mainly in March, April, or up to March, April, May, and some March and April and May. And you can see that in the Netherlands, there are three papers that have been published. I've been looking at the papers, specifically looking at ICU patients, and I have not looked in, and I left out most of the papers that look in the general ward because this is of interest to the ICU community. So you can see that actually, uh, we are looking at very high rates of DVTs and PEs in the Netherlands. PEs, you're looking at one at burn, it's up to 26.7%. Clock and middle dot, we're looking at about 30% or more. There are two publications from China and they're looking very, very high rates at about 25%, which if you remember, this is much higher than the baseline rate of ICU patients that you see that, was, that I presented in my first slide. In, in the Asian population, we're looking between six to 10%. So we're looking at very, very high VTA rates of 30% in this, uh, in this, uh, in this population of COVID-19 patients. But the evidence is heterogeneous. What do I mean by that? If you look at other studies from other countries like Italy, there's an international study, there's a study from France, and we look at them, that actually the DVT rates are not so high. We're looking at about 16%. The interesting study is this one by Helms by France. They actually look at non-COVID patients as a control. And their control rates is actually 1.3%, where, where their DVT rates in 16.7% or PE rates is 16.7% in those in the ICU with COVID-19. So comparatively, their VTE rates is high, and these patients are actually on chemoprophylaxis or pharmacoprophylaxis at it. So we're looking at about rates of 8 to 20%. So this is still higher than baseline. All right. And finally, we're looking at America. There are two studies that's published in America, and they're looking at slightly lower rates, about 7% as well. So you can see there's a huge heterogeneity of VTE rates around the world. What about Singapore for the local audience there is? Uh, we did have a study, now it's undergoing, undergoing review, and the VTE rates we see in ICU is about 2%. So in Singapore, it seems to be pretty low as well. So what does this all mean then? So all these studies shows high rates of VTE. Majority of cases are in early days of COVID-19 outbreak. I think we should bear that in mind, especially in Europe, when everything was, uh, lots of patients were coming in, they were extremely sick and extremely ill. Maybe that could push up to that. The pharmacoprophylaxis reduces the VTE that is really shown. And that shows there's still a role of VTE prophylaxis in critically ill patients. But the rates are high. So could we do better and can we do better? So that leads on to further uh, publications and recommendations by various society on the role of thromboprophylaxis for COVID-19 patients in ICU. So in this subsequent slides, I'll try to summarize what is the guidelines and evi or not evidence, but what are the uh, recommendations by the various societies. So what does America say? There is Canada, and we're summarizing those from American College of Cardiology, American uh, Society of Hematology, the NIH guidelines, and the CHESS guidelines. And all the guidelines in America is practically the same. All admitted COVID-19 patients should receive standard low molecular weight prophylaxis. So they don't regard whether you are in ICU or not in ICU, as long as you are admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 infections, everybody should receive pharmacological prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin, all right? And they did not recommend actually a higher doses or lower doses, they just said standard doses of low molecular weight heparin. Other guidelines are a bit more heterogeneous, all right? For the ISTH or what we call the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, uh, hospitalized patients with COVID-19 with respiratory failure and bed within and those requiring ICU should receive pharmacological prophylaxis. Um, WHO actually uses pharmacoprophylaxis as well. The British Thoracic Society actually, is, this is interesting because they said for standard patients, 
use standard uh, prophylactic doses of low macro heparin of 40 mg once a day. For high-risk patients, they actually recommend a higher dose, which is called the intermediate dose of low molecular heparin, which is in the local context, if you want to put it this way, will be enoxiparin 40 mg twice a day. This is the intermediate dose of low molecular heparin. So the high-risk patients would be those in ICU. The NIH guide of the Netherlands actually says that prophylactic dose for all patients, irrespective of risk cause, so is the UK. And for China, this is interesting because they actually came out with a guidelines of their thrombosis group. And for critically ill COVID patients, they chase low molecular heparin. Mild to moderate COVID-19 patients, you risk stratify them using risk assessment models for it. So what about Singapore? It would be good that we have guidelines and I'm, and I'm glad to tell you that there are guidelines currently being processed in Singapore and hopefully the guidelines will be ready in about a, a month or two times to give more, more clarity on how we should go on forward for, with this. As to the answers to all these trials, intermediate dose dosing, which all of you heard about, prophylactic dosing, intermediate dosing, therapeutic dosing of low molecular weight heparin, there are multiple and ongoing trials right now trying to address this problem, whether fixed dosing or the standard low mole prophylaxis is adequate or not. And there are currently four trials which I wrote about here, but there are numerous more other trials available and being run right now in the Western countries trying to see what is the best way to, to, to prophylax patients and to reduce the VTE rates in these patients. So in summary, what I've done here is just to tell you that in ICU patients, they're all at high risk of VTEs. And in the Western populations, if you see from Europe, there seems to be very high rates of VTE among the COVID-19 patients. The role of increased low molecular dose in COVID-19 is tempting because you think that because they seem to be breaking through standard prophylaxis, whether high dose prophylaxis would work. But I think that the trials are still ongoing and uh, we still really do not know whether it is effective or is it safe. So it's standard low molecular weight prophylaxis for now. And of course, we await local guidelines to help guide and uh, give more clarity in this aspect of it. And with this, uh, this is a very short summary, but I hope I can summarize all the evidence out there on the current uh, role and the current uh, evidence and the landscape of VTE prophylaxis in the ICU patients with COVID-19. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Thanks very much, Ing Su. Um, so just to remind everyone that uh, we will be taking your questions via the Q&A function of the Zoom app. You can submit your questions um, at the Q&A tab and we will try to address them at the end of the session. Um, next up, um, it, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eugene Fan. Uh, Dr. Eugene and I actually met um, as a result of COVID-19 um, uh, when we were working together looking after some patients in the MCRD ICU. And uh, Dr. Eugene received his uh, undergraduate medical degree from the National University of Singapore in 2007 and had attained his Master's of Internal Medicine and MRCP in 2012. He then completed specialist training in hematology in 2017 and is currently consultant with the Department of Hematology in Tan Tock Seng Hospital his interests are in thrombosis and hemostasis and in medical innovation. He received the National Medical Research Council Clinician Innovator Development Award in 2019. So all yours, Eugene. Uh, thanks, Jensen. Um, and thanks, Insu, for giving a very great summary of the VT evidence for COVID-19. Um, I'll be presenting on the challenges of thromboprophylaxis uh, and anticoagulation. I perhaps should have struck off the thromboprophylaxis, thromboprophylaxis bit because uh, it's been well covered. My disclosures are as follows. Um, the outline uh, that I hope to cover is firstly, what is the hemostatic state of the critically ill patient with COVID-19? And um, I will just touch briefly on the standard tests of hemostasis as well as how global hemostatic tests can help as us assess the hemostatic state. Um, next, uh, we'll just touch on the uh, pathophysiology of COVID-associated coagulopathy. And then following that, um, the next section will be on anticoagulation in critically ill 
uh, COVID-19 patients with acute thrombosis. So the choice of any coagulation, monitoring of any coagulation, and two case discussions, one on uh, acute ischemic limb and the other on a case discussion, um, discussing on ECMO. So, and then some brief data, um, which I think Eng Su already shared on, uh, on the ICU uh, incidence of thrombosis. And lastly, um, perhaps during the Q&A, we can also discuss risk benefit of um, thromboprophylaxis and escalated dose thromboprophylaxis. So um, firstly, what is the hemostatic state of the critically ill patient with COVID-19? Um, basically, what we can do is uh, lab tests to assess this. And the lab tests include uh, full blood count, uh, PT, APTT, fibrinogen, D-dimer. And in the ICU setting, uh, repeat testing of, of these tests are reasonable on a daily basis or less frequently, depending on the clinical state of the patient, uh, the initial results that we get and the trend in values. And generally, we don't repeat the D-dimer more than once a day. Um, this data came out from China initially, um, looking at survivors versus uh, non-survivors uh, of uh, patients who are critically ill with COVID-19. And you can see really three things here. Let me just put up my pointer. Um, the first thing is that the, the prothrombin time uh, in the non-survivor group was uh, increased. So 15 to 25% of non-survivors had a prolonged PT. The second thing that you can see here uh, in the lab characteristics is that there is marked hyperfibrinogenemia in both survivors and non-survivors. And the third thing you can see here is that in the D-dimer uh, profile, the non-survivors had a much way higher uh, D-dimer, uh, six times the upper limit of normal compared to survivors. So um, in data coming out from Italy, where the pandemic spread on to Europe, um, Hanigada et al. presented their data looking at uh, coagulation testing and uh, they found that, yes, uh, PT and APT were either normal or slightly prolonged. Failure counts were either normal or increased. We had hyperfibrinogenemia as well and uh, a raised D-dimer. Other interesting assays that they did were um, that of factor 8, and that was increased. And they found that one ribbon antigen uh, was also raised, and it's consistent with uh, endothelial dysfunction. And then there were other minor changes in the natural anticoagulants found. In our center, uh, the National Center for Infectious Diseases, uh, we just did a very quick uh, uh, study on a small cohort of 12 critically ill COVID-19 patients. And the uh, hemostatic assessment was done between uh, day 9 to day 20 of their illness. And interestingly, I mean, these patients were not then on pharmacological prophylaxis because they had then hit ICU. And uh, at the point of time, perhaps they were on mechanical prophylaxis. So we found similar findings, including a raised uh, factor 8 level, hyperfibrinogenemia. We found raised uh, increased von Willebrand factor antigen levels, and the D-dimer levels were also raised. 50% of our patients also had uh, lupus anticoagulant, which accounted for prolongation of the APTT. So uh, in summary, to summarize all the, the, the local and global findings uh, in severe COVID-19 infection, you can see a um, mild to moderate reduction in platelet count in, in the severe patients, uh, mild prolongation of the prothrombin time in the minority of patients, hyperfibrinogenemia in virtually all patients, with very low levels of, uh, in patients who are really uh, critically ill and actively dying, and, and a markedly raised uh, D-dimer level. And this is particularly so in non-survivors, where D-dimer levels that are persistently raised and, and elevated predict for mortality. So um, this can be easily um, accounted for uh, by this simple slide. So this slide uh, shows the pathophysiology of how a thrombosis uh, happens in, in COVID-19. And as we all know, the beta coronavirus uh, binds to the ACE2 receptor on the uh, type 2 pneumocytes, which are the alveolar epithelial cells. And they undergo viral replication within the cell and subsequently have uh, viremia or viral shedding. What then happens is that uh, there are two uh, underlying processes that kickstart uh, the thrombosis process. The first being endothelial dysfunction, resulting in the deranged coagulation profile we saw, the, the hyperfibrinogenemia, the race factor 8, and the Wolverine factor. And there's also platelet activation. The other thing that happens in severe COVID-19 infection is that um, the immune response is um, dysregulated. And what happens is there's a hyper-stimulation of the immune response, leading to a, a cytokine storm, 
And consequently, there is a hyperinflammatory state leading to uh, dysregulation of normal hemostasis. So in combination with several factors such as uh, hypoxia, uh, the endothelial dysfunction, hypercoagulable state, as well as immobility, this consists of the Verkaus triad of thrombosis, where the patients then develop uh, a thrombosis uh, either um, in, in the lungs or in extrapulmonary regions. So the breakdown of intravascular fibrin uh, would then lead to, as well as uh, alveolar fibrin exudates, would then lead to increased levels of D-dimer. Um, and in, 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 in total, um, the thrombotic phenomena uh, in the lungs uh, contribute to the ARDS-like uh, syndrome, uh, which may then culminate in multi-organ failure and death. So um, these are pathological slides looking at uh, patients who've had COVID-19. And uh, we can see very clearly that um, one, uh, there's multifocal endothelitis. Two, uh, there are microthrombi formed in the alveolar walls. And, and uh, the um, patients were compared with patients with H1N1 influenza. They found that microthrombi were nine times as prevalent uh, in patients with COVID-19 as with influenza. And they also found that there was increased uh, angiogenesis uh, in the increased amount of uh, new vessel growth, uh, which was 2.7 times as high as patients with influenza. So this can be actually summarized and uh, summed up in, in terms of uh, um, a key term called uh, pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy. And this was uh, proposed by McGonagall in Lancet Rheumatology. And, and um, the thought process being that the lungs are the epicenter for uh, thrombosis. And um, thromboinflammation is not new, it's not a new concept. And uh, Gila Branch had actually presented this work in 2017, uh, discussing the three states of, of uh, uh, thromboinflammation. And, and we can very clearly see here that um, in, in patients who have acute uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, they then have uh, the first um, uh, phase of thromboinflammation, which is adaptive hemostasis where uh, the red line represents platelets and uh, fibrinogen. So in this case, uh, in COVID-19, more of hyperfibrinogenemia. Um, and then subsequently, when they end up in ICU, um, they then um, may develop multi-organ failure. Some of them require dialysis, and a few of them may require uh, even ECMO support. And then the fibrinogen and the platelet count may start to taper down. At the same time, you can see that uh, the yellow lines represent the D-dimer, and the D-dimer starts to climb as they are, are critically ill. Uh, together with the fibrin monomer products. And towards the end stage where the patients are actively dying and sometimes they're phenotypic uh, bleeding, we can see that um, they, they fulfill the um, ISTH criteria for DIC, which include uh, prolonged uh, PT-APTT, hypofibrinogenemia or low, low fibrinogen counts, low platelets, as well as increased D-dimers. So besides our normal um, lab tests, uh, what about viscoelastic tests for COVID-19? So I hope to share with you two studies. Uh, but just a quick introduction that, uh, uh, that they are global hemostatic tests that are used for evaluation of mechanical properties of clot formation and lysis. They will help in uh, clinically um, and historically they've been used in uh, um, deciding uh, and helping with transfusion management in patients who have major bleeding particularly that of uh, in, in the massive transfusion protocol. And um, because they are both sensitive to hypocoagulability in, in patients who bleed and also hypercoagulability. And increased clot firmness has been associated with an occurrence of uh, venous thromboembolism in various clinical settings. However, this has not been well established in the emerging studies on COVID-19 patients. So um, back to Panigada and all, um, they discussed um, the other findings, which include um, the study of four patients uh, who they did uh, serial thromboelastography. As you can see here, um, this is uh, um, the um, thromboelastographic curve of uh, the normal uh, healthy volunteers. And these are the abnormal hypercoagulable uh, clot uh, waveforms that you can see here for um, the Italian COVID-19 patients. And what you can actually tell is that there's actually a re reduction in the reaction time, suggestive of uh, increased thrombin burst. There is a decreased clot formation uh, time, K, which uh, suggests increased uh, generation of fibrin. And um, thirdly, the maximum amplitude, which comprises of the clot strength, is also markedly increased compared to the normal uh, uh, controls. 
And lastly, clot lysis uh, was not seen in any of the patients um, that had TEG done subsequently. So um, this is another study looking at uh, Rotem, and this is also another uh, viscoelastic test. Uh, and this is a large, slightly larger cohort of 40 patients. And they found similar findings to Pan Panagida. Um, but what they also found was that the hypercoagulable state uh, in the ICU setting persists for the first five days and then uh, decreases in day 10 after without returning to normal values. Uh, other points to note was that they did not find any signs of secondary hyperfibrinolysis or sepsis-induced coagulopathy. And uh, in those patients that they, they reviewed, um, there were thrombotic uh, phen phenomena, including DVT, as well as line-related thrombosis. Just to change uh, gears, um, this is another global hemostatic test that may not be so familiar to intensivists, uh, but uh, to hematologists, um, we, we um, sometimes use this as um, a research parameter. So this is some um, clock waveform analysis. And this is a study published uh, locally uh, in Singapore General Hospital by um, Dr. Tan Chen Wen, a colleague in hematology. And um, basically, um, it shows that um, there are three patients in ICU um, with normal platelet count and normal uh, prothrombin time. However, the APTT uh, was slightly prolonged. So based on these three uh, parameters, you will not be able to tell that the patients actually are getting hypercoagulable. Uh, but if you look at the clock waveform parameters, uh, which we'll talk about later, the min one, min two, and next two, you can see just appreciate that the, the increasing trend in, in the numerical values of of these parameters as the ICU stay progresses. And, and so this is just to discuss um, briefly about how clot waveform analysis works. Uh, you have to look at the clot uh, analyzer. And essentially, we, the clot waveform analysis is derived from a photo-optical method of plotting time. Uh, the plasma is placed in the cuvette and, and light is shone through. So when uh, the clot is uh, being formed but after activation by adding in um, phospholipids and calcium, uh, there is clot formation that occurs and that results in um, decreased light transmission uh, through, through this cuvette. And the result of this decreased light transmission, we can then calculate the clotting time. In this case, it is APTT. Uh, at the same time, there is the extra data that is not utilized and this is the clot waveform parameters. So, Essentially, um, with a change in the light transmission due to the clock blocking off the light from the source, uh, and you do a differential of, the, of that, you get the uh, clock velocity or the mean one. And you do a further differential of that, you get the clock acceleration and the deceleration. So I, I would just like to make a statement here that, of course, this is still a research parameter. It's not been uh, validated in large studies, but it is generally helpful. And hopefully, in the, the two cases that I show you, um, you may, you may um, appreciate uh, the value of clock waveform analysis uh, to help us in evaluation of the, the thrombotic, thromboembolic state. So, in summary, this is a summary slide of um, what uh, investigations are largely available in most labs, the platelet count, the APTT, thrombin time, carbinogen, and D-dimers. Uh, and in most labs, we have anti tenny levels. In some uh, ICU centers, uh, utilize viscoelastic tests as well. I have told you that the... Um, and for evaluation of thrombotic risk, there is hyperfibrinogenemia. And in D-dimers, uh, a raised D-dimer may suggest and, and, and make us wonder whether the patient does have underlying thromboembolism. Uh, the viscoelastic tests uh, also uh, show that there is a hypercoagulable state, which may predispose the patients to thrombosis. And uh, for prognosis of a disease severity, a D-dimer, uh, once again, raised D-dimer is a harbinger for death. So, uh, in essence, all these tests do have limitations and unfortunately, these are all done uh, in, in vitro. We don't have in vivo testing to uh, replicate uh, what is happening actually in the endothelium, which is actually one of the key players in, in the, the uh, Burkhaus triad thrombosis. So, moving on next to the anticoagulation in COVID-19 patients with acute thrombosis, uh, the main role of either thromboprophylaxis uh, to prevent uh, clots or in the cases where they have, there are thrombosis, is really uh, to start any calculation and to aim for this sweet spot, which is to reduce the uh, adverse clinical events of the patient. So uh, conversely, if you look to the left of the curve, where if you don't anticoagulate patients uh, or we give suboptimal um, antithrombotic therapy, the, the rates of thrombotic events will be high. However, if they are over anticoagulated, then the bleeding events uh, will then 
uh, increase. So this is just a very brief uh, summary slide of what the ISTH DIC subcommittee has communicated on the recommendations for anticoagulation. Uh, and I think Ingsu has briefly touched a bit about the thromboprophylaxis uh, by the ISTH. So um, ISTH has recommendations that all hospitalized patients should be on some form of uh, thromboprophylaxis, ideally with low molecular weight heparin. However, if you do have a worsening clinical situation where there is hypoxia and increasing oxygen requirements, or there's a clinical suspicion of a palmy thrombine, then they recommend uh, imaging. And if you find thrombosis on imaging, then the recommendation, of course, is to therapeutically anticoagulate the patient. However, if you do not find anything, then the suspicion is that, is there some kind of microthrombi that's happening? Is there some kind of PIC, primary intravascular coagulopathy? And one would then um, consider increasing the prophylactic dose of heparin. Now, this uh, recommendation is still controversial because half the experts in ISTH recommend this, whereas half do not. Um, in the event that you're unable to actually uh, image the patient, or if there's extracorporeal circuit thrombosis, such as dialysis, catheter thrombosis, then the recommendation is actually to consider uh, studying them on full dose of therapeutic anticoagulation. So I will move then to our two cases, which may highlight to us the utility and role of uh, hem global hemostatic tests together with hemostatic tests and how um, they, um, we can actually manage them in the ICU. So the first is on really on uh, acute limb ischemia. The Italians published um, two young non-arteriosclerotic patients with COVID-19 in Lancet. And um, in, in NCID also, um, we subsequently found uh, five patients of which the first two were written up by our surgical colleagues in BGS. And um, this is the first patient that actually presented um, in NCID. Uh, he presented with um, COVID-19 and he had a right cold, uh, pain, painful and cold foot. And the CT angiogram found a right profunda as well as popliteal artery thrombosis. Like the scan was extended and we actually found this um, 1.5 by 2 cm toraco abdominal aortic thrombus. You can see this on the IR findings as well. And what the surgeons did was actually they jailed off the thrombus by putting in a stand and they did a uh, thrombectomy. Uh, prior to surgery, we did um, hemostatic markers and then, and then you can clearly see that he's in an inflammatory state. The PT, APTT was slightly uh, prolonged. There was a raised D dimer, there was hyperfibrinogenemia and, and lupus anticoagulant was weakly present. You can see very clearly here that uh, all the factors here are raised with uh, markedly raised factor 8, and the von Braun factor also is raised. So this is in keeping with the phenotypic manifestation of uh, thrombosis. And thromboblastography also uh, reflects this, where you can see that uh, increased uh, uh, angle as well as increased maximal amplitude of uh, the thromboelastogram uh, uh, shows that there is uh, uh, thrombosis, or uh, rather there is a hypercoagulable state and you, if you look, think about the um, uh, model that I showed you just now, the patient is most likely in this phase of uh, mild adaptive hemostasis where the, uh, there is marked hyperfibrinogenemia. The top waveform analysis echoes these findings. So I'll just take you through um, this very quickly. The colored lines are the normal patients, whereas the black line represents uh, the patient with the acute ischemic limb. You can see here that there is marked decrease in the blood transmission showing that the clot formation is very thick, uh, preventing light from going through. And doing the different shows, you can find that the clot velocity is very raised compared to the normals, and the clot acceleration and deceleration were also um, increased. So this patient um, had interesting uh, presentation of heparin resistance post-op. And uh, initially, we started the heparin uh, uh, on, on the day of presentation. The surgery was scheduled the next day. And um, you can see a declining trend of the anti tna levels, uh, despite uh, maintaining him and increasing the heparin infusion. Um, the heparin was stopped in early morning, and the, the patient went for surgery the next day uh, at 8 a.m. He underwent the embolectomy and stenting, as you saw. And heparin was resumed in the afternoon when he returned to the ICU. Now, we had difficulty with attaining um, anti tna levels. So the target anti tna levels are recommended for patients on uh, unfractionated heparin would be between 0.3 to 0.7. But in this case, we were, in, we were desperately increasing the uh, IV heparin to a point at 12 p.m. the next day where it was at 1,500 units per hour. Uh, 
of course, we then were wondering whether he had uh, antithrombin deficiency, but that was normal. And uh, we then switched to um, low molecular weight heparin, which had bio better bioavailability. We attained quite satisfactory levels of antitemi shortly after. So in heparin resistance, um, the definition is a daily dose in excess of 35,000 units to achieve a therapeutic range. And the phenomenon occurs because of the heparin's ability to bind to uh, various acute phase plasma proteins. This is during the acute uh, COVID-19 infection, but also post-op where there's a lot of endothelial and endovascular damage due to surgery. Uh, it also binds the cells, so the macrophages and activated endothelial cells will bind the heparin, and because they are also activated in COVID-19. Um, the low antithrombin levels are one thing to consider, but they are not commonly seen in, in COVID-19 patients, uh, with most patients having plasma levels within normal to low range. Um, and this has been described in other centers as well. This is a center looking at uh, heparin resistance. So they describe a very high percentage of patients having either resistance to unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And most likely because of the um, inflammatory malu that um, occurs with uh, severe COVID-19 infection. Um, so how do we overcome this? Um, practical solution is really to finally first find um, the, out the truth. So the ground truth will be really to do uh, both APTT and um, factor 10 -ase. We didn't do APTT for him, or we didn't take the APTT into account because this patient that we had, uh, had a lupus anticoagulant, which artificially prolonged the APTT. However, if monitoring is impractical in certain centers, then um, one option is to switch um, unfractionated heparin to longer acting uh, um, um, agents such as low molecular weight heparin. Um, and this has been studied in critically ill patients, uh, even in markedly re impaired renal function without monitoring with, with no adverse events. So what are the anticoagulation recommendations for acute thrombosis in COVID-19? I think um, the ISTH has not really come up with any um, strong recommendation on what to use, but essentially uh, in this guidance by the Anticoagulation Forum uh, published in the Journal of Thrombosis, Thrombolysis, uh, they suggested use of low molecular weight heparin or low infection heparin to, for treatment of confirmed or suspected VTE where possible. And the main rationale behind this is really to avoid the additional laboratory monitoring because of the narrow therapeutic uh, window of infection heparin and also to minimize the nursing and phlebotomy exposure to a patient with um, active COVID-19 and to also limit the use of PPE. They also recommend uh, use of nd rather than APTT um, for various reasons, including high incidence of lupus anticoagulant in ICU patients. And uh, the recommendation for duration is a three-month course of therapeutic anticoagulation for patients with COVID-19 and uh, VTE. So the next case is a case uh, who um, Jensen and I also managed. And this is a 40-year-old uh, male who was on mechanical ventilation for severe COVID-19 pneumonia. He was day 17 of uh, illness and um, he required ECMO. Then he had prior to this uh, heart attack with a non-STEMI and he was on dual antiplatelets and the coax then at a point of assessment when he started uh, uh, initiation of the ECMO was platelets were borderline uh, but normal. Uh, PT and APTT were slightly prolonged. Fibrillation was normal and d was markedly prolonged. So um, on, on this date, the ECMO started, the dual antiplatelets were stopped. He was given uh, prior transfusion of platelets and FFP before uh, cannulation of lines for the ECMO. Uh, we did give some vitamin K for three days and generally there was no uh, heparin given during cannulation as well because of the concerns of bleeding uh, from the line insertion site. So unfortunately, during the second day of the ECMO run, um, the um, perfusionist found that there were clots found in the oxygenator uh, in the evening and as well as uh, clotting seen in the uh, CRRT circuit as well as he was undergoing dialysis. So um, IV heparin was then uh, initiated with a bolus as well as infusion followed by uh, the uh, continuing uh, IV vitamin K as well. We did a uh, preliminary uh, evaluation of this patient given that he had clots and um, you can see now that the uh, PTAPTD have been even more prolonged. Uh, the D-dimer is still markedly raised. He has an inflammatory state with uh, rise in the CRP. There was, once again, a positive uh, lupus anticoagulant and it was moderately present. Uh, 
Interestingly, um, there was consumption of clotting factors. Um, you can see here that the only clotting factor that was elevated was factor eight, whereas the other factors in blue actually were on the low end. And um, factor eight, as well as formulin factor, are also raised mainly because these are also acute phase reactants. Uh, and it is likely that if you look at the um, general three phases of uh, thrombo, uh, thr thrombosis, uh, in, in patients with sepsis, uh, he's most likely in the uh, thrombotic BIC phase with multi-organ failure requiring dialysis and ECMO with a declining uh, fibrinogen level, it's still normal but coming down, uh, with uptrending PTAPTT and uh, decreasing factors. So what does the TEG show? The TEG actually was, was normal. Um, the uh, TEG showed a normal R time, normal alpha angle, normal maximum amplitude, and normal uh, clot lysis. And this is perhaps because um, while the clotting factors were on the borderline low side, uh, anything above 40 is generally uh, uh, will, will actually um, give fairly robust clot formation uh, despite these factors being depressed. And he also had a normal uh, platelet count and of course normal fibrinogen level. So in essence, the, the, in, the, the testing for uh, his whole blood basic t baseline TEG was actually normal. So we started uh, Clexane for him, and the clot waveform analysis also reflects a fairly normal, actually robust clot formation. However, this was delayed, uh, the APTT curves were delayed because of the presence of a lupus anticoagulant. He had a, a normal uh, clot velocity and slightly depressed clot uh, acceleration and deceleration, perhaps because of decreased uh, thrombin generation and slightly decreased uh, clotting factors. So, um, Thrombosis in, in extracorporeal circuits have been actually described uh, and there, there are increasing case reports of uh, findings of early onset of uh, the, this uh, um, thrombosis in, in uh, extracorporeal circuits. So this is a study looking at um, clots in ECMO patients where there were high incidence of uh, centrifugal pump head thrombosis and in, in, in patients undergoing dialysis, uh, the, the median filter life uh, of um, the dialysis filter uh, in some patients were very short, uh, up to 6.5 hours. So for the outpatient, uh, once he was on therapeutic anticoagulation, we very closely monitored his antitany levels and he, he met uh, targets of between 0.3 to 0.7. However, shortly after um, um, an event happened, but during monitoring, uh, what may happen is that we usually pair uh, these two uh, two or more tests, rather, to, to check um, these uh, decoagulation levels to ensure that we are safely decoagulating these patients. However, some caveats to note would be that the APTT may be affected by the presence of a lupus and as well as may be suppressed or brought down by um, high factor levels. Activated clotting time is used mainly in ECMO um, and, however, it's insensitive to low doses on, of unfractionated heparin. The antitany levels which we did for the patient uh, can also be affected in, by the presence of hyperbilirubinemia as well as free hemoglobin. And free hemoglobin may happen when we uh, pass blood through um, extracorporeal circuits. And this is because the antitany is a chromogenic test. And so um, the presence of free bilirubin or free hemoglobin may discolor the plasma and therefore result in an underestimation of the presence of unfractionated heparin. Viscoelastic tests are supported by the ELSO guidelines and can be used as well to monitor and coagulation. So unfortunately, he developed uh, anisocoria, dilated pupil, and um, we did a quick urgent CT scan which showed bleeding, uh, multifocal catastrophic bleeding. This is a blood fluid level uh, that you can see here. And uh, we quickly did um, coagulation profiling to, to see what we could correct. Uh, in the end, um, we corrected the, the low platelets and um, we can see that actually um, from that time to the time of assessment when he had bleeding, the factor levels had actually increased. Uh, this is most likely because uh, there was some component of bit K deficiency which had corrected over time. So in essence, um, from the, for the uh, baseline hemostatic profile, I think uh, apart from just borderline low platelets, platelets about 50 should uh, ideally uh, provide still good hemostasis. The clotting factors were ideal. Uh, the TEG also uh, supported this, showing that uh, the um, MA actually was um, good um, in the um, CKH, which has heparinase, 
to neutralize the heparin within the blood sample and the maximum altitude of the um, clot is still uh, very good. Um, so we postulate, uh, given that you know, the, the hemostatic test as well as the TEG actually show uh, normal clotting uh, in, in, in vitro, uh, but um, we, we postulate that um, this patient might have developed uh, prior to um, or during the ECMO uh, some kind of uh, microhemorrhage or diffuse uh, leukoencephalopathy, and this is a case series showing uh, in severe COVID-19 patients uh, development of these uh, brain changes. And unfortunately, if we commit the patient to anticoagulation and the patient has some foci of bleeding, uh, the presence of anticoagulation may precipitate catastrophic intracranial hemorrhage. This has been also um, seen in other case series. This is a case series of 10 patients where four patients developed devastating intracranial hemorrhage during BV ECMO. So looking at our, our ICU data for blood transfusion and patients who've had uh, major bleeding. This is a um, this is a very busy slide, but uh, they, these these were patients from uh, ICU uh, from the time of uh, February to May, and these are seven patients. Each square of these patients represents a day of their treatment, and uh, the orange squares represent uh, days in ICU. The the red squares represent uh, the days where they had episode of major bleeding by the ISTH criteria. The black squares represent uh, demise. So out of the seven patients who had major bleeding. You can see here that four patients uh, in, in the end passed away. Um, there are some patients that had recurrent uh, multiple bleeding uh, and the bleedings, uh, the major bleeding usually happen uh, mostly in the GI tract. Uh, we had two patients who had uh, catastrophic intracranial bleed while on ECMO and there were some patients who had also um, major bleeding from the lines. So I think we uh, briefly discussed uh, the, the uh, risk benefit of thromboprophylaxis in ICU, but perhaps during the forum discussion, we can take it further. Uh, and really, um, it is uh, the way the, the pros and cons of you know, standard thromboprophylaxis versus escalated dose prophylaxis. Um, and if you can see here, um, as Wat Eng so nicely summarized in his slides, um, these are incidents of venous thromboembolic events in COVID-19 ICU patients, where these were the Dutch uh, patients that Engsu mentioned. This is a China study. And those um, with the, the, the um, arrows on top uh, are, are studies that actually purposely looked and screened for patients with either uh, VTE by doing a lower limb Doppler or uh, CTPA. So you can see here that obviously the patients uh, the, the studies that actually had uh, symptomatic patients uh, and had no um, intent for screening had lower incidences of VTE versus uh, those studies that actually look very hard for uh, VTE. So in our study, um, this is a multi-center study initiated by the Society of uh, Hematology in Singapore. And uh, it's a multi-center study um, uh, combining eight ICUs around the island. And th these were 111 patients. Um, the final, final results were that uh, we had seen a low uh, venous uh, thrombosis rate of 2%, uh, as what Eng Su mentioned, and a higher uh, incidence of arterial thrombosis rates. These arterial thrombosis uh, are commonly seen uh, in patients with uh, acute myocardial infarction, um, in some patients with a stroke, as well as in rarely um, the patients with uh, acute ischemic limb. Now, major bleeding uh, rate was also high, at almost close to 15%. So um, the conclusion for this uh, study, which is still under review, is that uh, critically ill patients in Singapore do have a uh, lower, lower venous thromboembolism rate. However, these were um, only on symptomatic uh, patients. We did not purposely uh, scan their lower limbs or do a CTPA to look for VTE, uh, and, but higher arterial thrombotic rates and breathing manifestation than other reported cohorts. So in summary, um, in, I've shown you that uh, COVID-19 is associated with extreme inflammatory response, disordered hemostasis, and high thrombotic risk. Uh, we can see that um, the lungs are the epicenter for COVID-associated coagulopathy, uh, and, and with this new term of pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy being coined. Uh, monitoring of anticoagulation can be challenging, and the recommendation from some guidelines and also in our center is we practice PET tests for therapeutic monitoring of um, patients on IV unfractionated heparin. Um, the use of global hemostatic tests uh, such as thromboelastography as well as clot waveform 
can be helpful as point of care tests in the acute setting when there is acute bleeding or acute thrombosis to assess for either the hypercoagulable states or hyperco hypocoagulable states. There is definitely a higher incidence of thrombosis than bleeding in most of the studies seen in the ICU patients. Uh, and hence, um, in, in most major guidelines, all major guidelines, thromboprophylaxis is recommended in the ICU patients, bearing in mind that major bleeding remains a major comorbidity in our ICU setting. With that, I thank you, and I pass the time on to Jensen. Thank you, Eugene, for a very comprehensive uh, overview of the challenges that we face um, in managing patients in the ICU with regards to the coagulation status. So um, moving on, we are at the last segment of this uh, afternoon's uh, track. And uh, I'd like to invite now the, all the panelists back to, the, um, to, join, to rejoin us. And um, so uh, Dr. Ravi and Dr. Yap, um, and as well as Dr. Eugene. So um, just to remind everybody that uh, feel free to post your questions on the Q&A function of the Zoom app. And um, I think at the moment we do not have any questions, but I, I guess I can uh, get things rolling by posing a few. Um, and um, so, the, I, so my first question would be directed at uh, both our panelists today. Uh, maybe I'll start off with uh, Dr. Yap. Um, and that would be, uh, I think you shared with us several um, guidelines and you summarized them very nicely for us. Um, but bear in mind that these are usually developed for the purpose of Western populations. And how would we, how would you suggest that we apply or modify this um, to fit our local context where mostly um, uh, we're dealing with Asian patients? Yeah, so um, I think right now, currently right now, um, I am working with the Ministry of Health uh, to come up with a set of guidelines for COVID-19. So we are, the Ministry of Health is looking towards uh, a unified um, um, guideline for this uh, with various groups as well, with the cardiologists, the neurologists, psychiatrists, and even intensivists and pulmonologists as well. So within our own society itself, the chapter of hematologists and society of hematology, we have a discussion and of course Eugene is also on the discussion panel as well. Uh, I think we are driven a lot by our own local data and it's fortunate that we do have some local data available. Like I said, un the article under review, we do have very low uh, VTE rates while we do have high arterial rates. So in view of that, uh, our recommendations is going to be pretty, um, how do you call it, conservative. Uh, I can't go into the details yet because the guidelines have not been uh, finalized, but I will say that we are more in on the conservative side in which we will, in IC, I think in intensive in patients with COVID-19 intensive care, I think that there is no question that we'll, they will all require um, some form of chemo prophylaxis if there's no contraindication and definitely mechanical prophylaxis if there is but it's the general ward and the patients out in the community or in the community isolation facilities that there is going to be a great challenge in what to do with these uh, patients as well. Because oh, bearing in mind, I think Eugene has a very nice slide, risk-benefit ratio, where, where do we find the balance in which where you start anticoagulation and you do not cause excessive bleeding in that case. Yeah. Eugene? Yeah, I think Thanks, Jason, and, and thanks also for, for um, your thoughts. Um, yeah, it's a very difficult question to, with regards to a universal thromboprophylaxis, but it's very clear cut um, that in the ICU patients, uh, there is benefit for thromboprophylaxis to be started, mainly because we, if you think of the pathophysiology, uh, the lungs being the epicenter of thrombosis, um, we want to prevent uh, uh, development of uh, micro and macro vascular thrombi. So, uh, and because this will, be, will then lead to the patient then going down the route of ARDS and requiring intubation. So, uh, but once they hit ICU, I think we're quite lucky in Singapore because um, for a lot of the patients, uh, we take them in early. So when they descend, um, we, we already um, bring them in. But I think in the UK setting and, and other countries, perhaps uh, because of the, uh, the pandemic, which was um, out of control in, in, in Europe, um, most of the ICU patients will likely have come in intubated really and requiring oxygen. So um, we are dealing with a different profile of uh, 
uh, patients as well. Uh, but having said that, if we, when we take them early, we start them on uh, antiviral treatment, we start them on anticoagulation or tumor prophylaxis, uh, we, we will actually uh, uh, see decrease, decreasing rates of uh, thromboembolism in these patients. And hence, I think in our study of 109 patients, we, we, do, we actually do see uh, decreased rates. Having said that, two-thirds of the patients were on tumor prophylaxis, one-third were not, they were on mechanical prophylaxis. And these were studies done on early third, in early days where we, we didn't really have a good uh, grasp of uh, whether these patients should be anticoagulated or not. Yeah, I think it's very, it's interesting, very interesting that uh, in the, the study that you shared, um, done by the Society of Hematologists, that our overall rates of VTEs are pretty low, 2%. And not just that, the bleeding manifestations seem to be many, many times that. And, um, and there's quite a significant um, arterial thrombosis rates as well. So uh, perhaps it's because we are, uh, we are bringing the patients in earlier to the ICU compared to uh, some of the other series that have been published around the world. Um, so, and I suppose that uh, stands to reason that um, whatever guidelines that eventually will be released, we'll probably see something that's more conservative uh, compared to what's been uh, recommended in the Western society so far. Um, does Dr. Ravi have, uh, what about the experience in in um, India, if you're able to share with us or um, your, your part of the world? So, so, uh, so uh, I think a lot of publications are coming up and uh, as we are seeing that every publication shows some specific scenario and uh, very interestingly, I saw this publication of very less venous thromboembolism and then more of arterial thrombosis uh, from uh, Singapore. So I think more and more data will evolve because as Dr. Eng Su has said that so many publications are ongoing, so many studies are ongoing, we may get some more light uh, from the published guidelines and also consensus statements in future. Uh, I think uh, one, one question which, uh, or, or a point of uh, discussion which comes to my mind is about the uh, risk assessment. So I'm just directing it to both of my panelists, Dr. Eugene and Dr. Eng. So do we think that for thrombotic risk assessment in a particular patient who is COVID-19 suffering, do we, is there as a, a role of any scoring system? Because I heard from some of the speakers that there is some scoring system like improved DD and all those. What do you think about those scoring systems? Do they play a role here in this context? Um, there is no validated study, of course, in COVID-19 patients. I think um, there's two, as you rightly said, there's the improved, uh, there is the improved uh, risk assessment scoring and there's the PADUA, which is mainly used for medical patients and you can use the Caprini for the surgical patients. Um, the, the question here is that does COVID-19 in, in both the scoring adds towards uh, what we call an uh, increase in, in, is it called a pro-thrombotic state? I think that's the question whether you fit that into the score. I think we don't know. Uh, I think there's only one recommendation by the society and that's by the China that actually use the PADUA scoring for their risk assessment score and that's what they recommend. And I think that is something that we will, in Singapore, we will adapt to it, especially in patients not in the ICU. So critically ill patients, because they're critically ill, you do not need a risk assessment uh, modeling for them. But okay. those who are actually well, not on oxygen COVID-19 patients, uh, those, you most probably, a risk assessment model will be very useful. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Enzo. Does Eugene have anything to add to that? I agree with Engsu. Um, in, in the ICU patients, the, the, the traditional um, risk scoring is a PADUA score for mm -hmm. medical and the Caprini for surgical. And if you think about the PADUA score, if you have respiratory failure plus also uh, immobility, that's four points already. And, and that would, that would you automatically put you at, at uh, in the high risk for, for, for yeah. thromboprophylaxis. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the, the main thing will be patients who are in the non-ICU setting and can we actually uh, initiate uh, thromboprophylaxis uh, earlier on before even the hit ICU to retard the uh, primary intravascular coagulopathy that is ongoing because of the pneumonia. So this is a very interesting area where we need more data um, and we need more local data to, to show because what are the numbers needed to treat uh, these patients, we, we don't have those answers. And um, obviously, we've, we've seen a lot of bleeding as well in, in the ICU patients. So 
these are factors that we also need to consider. It's not just straightforward um, trouble prophylaxing them and, and just leaving them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think to Jensen, yeah. tying in nicely with, with uh, discussion in, on the thromboprophylaxis in ICU patients is, is that uh, one of the questions from the audience is about escalated doses of thromboprophylaxis. I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on who you would um, apply escalated doses of thromboprophylaxis, if any at all, um, whether in the local context or in, for our audiences from overseas as well? So for the overseas, uh, if I may, is that uh, there are studies, as I showed earlier, there are clinical trials right now. One. one is driven by the uh, Canadian group. They are very, they are looking towards, uh, some are even asking for what we call, uh, super, uh, what we call uh, higher doses of thromboprophylaxis, like Clexane, 40 milligrams BD. There are some also even say that you should put them all on therapeutic anticoagulation dosing. So these trials are, currently being uh, being held and being used. There are a couple, uh, as I shared earlier, the British Thoracic Society did recommend that you should use intermediate uh, doses for patients in high risk. So that will most probably uh, apply to the ICU patients. But I think overall is that um, is if you see the guidelines that's out, in, out there, it's mainly driven by the studies of their country. So in the Europeans, they are a bit more aggressive. So is the Canadians because of high rates of DVT that they see. So they assume, I think, rightly, rightly or wrongly, only time will tell, that a higher dose of thromboprophylaxis will be useful in these patients. But I think the trials will, the trials, hopefully they will come out, I think by December or January, looking at the expected data recruitment they should get and the results should be out by next year, then we will be able to tell. Right now, I'll say that we are just scouring in the dark as well, those in Singapore, as I said, uh, looking at our own data, I would not recommend um, higher doses of thromboprophylaxis. Although I will say that in the early days when I was involved in some of the COVID patients, I do, and we did put some of them on higher doses, but looking back, looking at such low, do such low rates of DVTs in our ICU patients and high risk of bleeding, I would no longer do so. But I think local data is very important to drive your decision. I think agree with Feng Su. I think we were shaped by our initial experience uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we were managing them in NCID. And uh, we didn't see more bleeders than, than thrombosis. Um, having said that, I mean, if you look at the uh, clock study, the, Dutch, the first Dutch study, which is a landmark study, um, these patients were actually already on thromboprophylaxis and they then developed uh, clots. But of course, you have to look at the patient profile. These are older very much older Dutch patients as well. So I think age is, is a major uh, risk factor for developing thrombosis. Whereas in our population, I think we, we saw slightly younger uh, uh, profile of patients. Um, so I think for the European side, because they have seen so much uh, thrombosis, even on top of standard dose and decoagulation or rather thromboprophylaxis, the, some of the ISTH members are leaning, have leaned towards escalated dose or full therapeutic dose and coagulation because they were shaped by the experience. Whereas, uh, you know, in Asia, in our, in our, in our site, um, apart from China, because China, I think in, in Wuhan, um, if you look at the data also, um, that, that was uh, the epicenter of the outbreak. And I think uh, the medical facilities and the manpower was very stretched. And so the patients, the patient didn't receive perhaps optimal care at that point of time. But in the local setting in Singapore, our healthcare resources have thankfully not been uh, overwhelmed and we're able to actually usher in these patients to ICU uh, promptly and, and institute management quickly. So I think, um, yeah, to, to get back to the question, you know, um, it's difficult uh, at this point of time, given our local data, to push very hard. Unless there's a very strong clinical suspicion that the patient has uh, a pulmonary embolism, uh, we could Sort of, and but we can't actually do imaging, and that, that may push us to sort of decide towards uh, therapeutic dose and decoagulation. Thank you. Thanks for that. I think it's a, uh, I find it really, really challenging because um, on the one hand, uh, we all seem to think that the local population does have a low prevalence of venous thromboembolism compared to the Western counterparts. But on the other hand, um, when we're talking about the Singapore uh, 
context, there is actually a very diverse um, mixture of ethnicities that we're dealing with. So, and every, uh, and I think there are clearly some um, differences between the, the ethnic groups uh, with regards to the thrombotic risk as well. Um, so, so moving on from the uh, initiation and the doses, how long should our patients be placed on thromboprophylaxis when we do start it in the ICU? Would uh, you just stop it once you know the patient is uh, well off the ventilator and uh, ambulance, you know, mobile, or continue for a period after that? I think the evidence for this or the recommendations for this is even more um, heterogeneous. Mm. There is a paper published by the Americans that uh, after a patient has been discharged uh, with COVID-19, they have a re-admission, they have a DVT rate of about 4%, if I'm not wrong. That is the only paper that looked at discharge patients with COVID-19. So, but also other societies have also recommended uh, extended chemoprophylaxis, like some have recommended up to 45 days. If I'm not wrong, that's the Canadians who's actually recommending for it. But various societies have varied from all the way from 14 days to, to, to four to five weeks. And some of them never even mentioned. So I think the, the take home message I get from all this is that nobody knows exactly um, locally, would we put them on? I don't think any of us did. I uh, don't know about you, Eugene, whether you did or not, but I didn't. Uh, could we change them to some form of oral uh, DOAC? I would say no one knows, uh, but those with DVTs and proven VTEs, those COVID-19 patients with proven DVTs and PEs, upon discharge, I do switch them to DOACs. Mm. So yeah, but for prophylaxis, I think um, nobody really knows. I think you just follow the standard risk assessment scores, you, whether there's ongoing risk factors for the patient and you risk assess them individually and decide then. Right. Yeah, I agree with Su. I think if we, we don't have the answer and we need more data. Uh, having said that, um, for patients who are actually not on any combination or tumor prophylaxis and they have actually done been discharged, uh, at NCID, we've been seeing some cases coming in. These are non-ICU patients who actually were asymptomatic. And they then later on presented with uh, arterial events, which were quite catastrophic. Mm. So, um, and as you know, in Singapore, the, um, the host the, uh, of, of, of the um, COVID-19 has changed. The initial few, first few months, uh, these were local, mostly local population. With at the start, probably some uh, patients from China. But subsequently, because of the migrant worker population uh, that had uh, outbreaks in the dorm, uh, with the host actually migrated to um, the South uh, Indian, South Asian ethnicity. And we've been seeing some of these patients come in, and these patients have had uh, no really prior arteriosclerotic or, or cardiovascular risk factors, but they have had uh, you know, uh, severe uh, thrombotic events, like uh, for instance, stroke in, in young patients or even AMI. Uh, and and the um, one patient had even the uh, acute ischemic bleed. So in those patients, yes, I mean ideally we should have thromboprophylax, but then again, what is our our threshold and what is our screening mechanism? It is it is very hard to say because for the large majority of migrant worker population who are infected, uh, we don't we don't see that. So so I think more studies are required to assess. The, the hemostatic profile and to see whether the, a persistent and hypercoagulable state uh, persists beyond ICU, beyond hospital discharge. And, and that may then uh, sort of allude us to consider some kind of uh, true prophylaxis. Thanks, thanks. Thanks to you both. Um, Dr. Ravi, have anything to add? Yeah, so I, I was saying that we are discussing this uh, for optimize the strategy. We, we need more data. Some data is in the process. So maybe uh, because you guys are actively treating and going towards the consensus development of Singapore. Yeah. Uh, for us, for our guidance, I, I will just look forward that when we say we need more uh, data, I think uh, can you can just summarize few pointers, what kind of data generation will really help to come towards more optimize the strategy in COVID-19 patients. Any pointers towards that for us? I think uh, for ICU, I think the, there's a lot of studies now ongoing whether we should have standard versus mm -hmm. um, intermediate dosing or even therapeutic dosing. Mm -hmm. 
and how to stratify them, that will be very useful within intensive care. The challenge will be the more heterogeneous kind, the patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 with mild to moderate symptoms, not requiring oxygen. Should they be on prophylaxis? Maybe would it risk scoring be better or should we just put all of them on low molecular weight heparin? And I think finally, the last, the more question is those out in the extended prophylaxis. What is the role of extended prophylaxis? Should it be done? What's the agent of choice? I think it's very unpalatable for patients to be on one month of low molecular weight heparin on discharge. I think logistically, it's also going to be very difficult. And mm -hmm. if, we are, if number one, is it, I think the community, which is the majority of the patients actually with COVID-19, which you can see that the admission rates to ICU ranges from 1%, like Singapore is like 0.1%, all the way to maybe 10%. And then the vast majority of these patients will be in the community or hospitalized. And like we said, we are seeing more and more late presentations of arterial events and sometimes venous events. So should we prophylax them? Can we prophylax them? Or who should we prophylax? I think all these are questions that we really do not know. Okay. Understand. And one more point, uh, Dr. Jensen and all three of you, which comes about the, I know, D-dimer is something which we can keep on talking and it's pluses and minuses, but in this context of COVID-19, do somewhere, because we were hearing to a lot of experts in the past, do D-dimer in some way help us in this scenario in terms of understanding the severity or this patient is at high risk? What is that broad outline about D-dimer in this context? I think the, for D-dimer, the problem really is um, reproducibility of results because different labs have different assays for D-dimer. And the D-dimer, if you think about it, is really optimized towards 0 0.5, which is the cutoff for a screening in, in the A&E or ambulatory patients where you suspect a DVT. Beyond that, uh, if you go up to like 20, for instance, where in our mm -hmm. lab, mm -hmm. the, the accuracy you know, um, falls off. And the problem being D-dimer is, once again, a very non-specific uh, uh, test. So it can be raised in you know, immobile patients. It can be raised in patients with cancer. It can be raised in patients with uh, gross obesity or even pregnancy. So, um, but, but having said that, um, it is also a um, fairly good marker in terms of prognosis. So, for instance, that the second patient that I presented, he had a D-dimer 120, and that predicted for eventual you know, ECMO and, and yes. follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that if, if you have a patient with a raised D-dimer and it's unexplained, you cannot you know, figure out why his D-dimer is raised, then that, that may trigger, uh, and he has COVID-19, that may trigger you to hunt and search hard for uh, you know, venous thromboembolic uh, phenomenon in the patient. Yeah. I think I agree, uh, agree uh, with Eugene. I think while we were formulating our local guidelines, this came up as well. I think Eugene, you were with the discussion as well. Should we use D-Diner as a prognostication? There are some, um, some expert opinions as well using D-Diner of more than one or more than two. This depends on the studies because these have been associated with higher mortality and they use that to up step or step up the prophylaxis to maybe intermediate dose or therapeutic. But I think that approach is controversial as usual. And uh, we don't know whether that's the right approach as well. Okay. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Jensen. I just want to shift the uh, discussion a little bit to, uh, um, to the pre-ICU state or stage of the patient's uh, journey in the hospital. Um, I know in the NCID, uh, some guidelines were released recently, not sure if they were disseminated to the local, local community on uh, starting uh, consideration for thromboprophylaxis, chemical thromboprophylaxis for patients who are on some form of oxygen therapy um, when they are in the, in the general ward. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? And I'm uh, just curious as to what the practice is in NUH as well. I, I wasn't part of the NCRD guidelines, lot, but I think um, to put things in context, if there is some kind of systemic inflammation ongoing, or there, if there's a patch on the X-ray, then likely this is going to be systemic. And if we know that you know the CRP LDH is raised, then likely you know um, thromboembolism or or, or um, microthrombi formation is already occurring within the, the lung. But having said that, a lot of patients get away, you know even without thromboprophylaxis in, in the early days. Uh, 
mm. where we just treated the pneumonia, we gave them supplemental oxygen, we hydrated them, we kept them mobile, and, and they didn't suffer any uh, mm. symptomatic VT. We, we don't know whether they had asymptomatic VT because we, we didn't screen them. Mm. But um, yes, I think um, moving forward, one problem is, of course, we don't have any clinical test or model to look at endothelial dysfunction. And, and that is quite key like, in, in the um, pathogenesis of thrombosis for COVID-19 because it, it really, the, the SARS-CoV virus binds to the ACE2 receptor uh, in, in the endothelium and causes inflammation. So if there's ongoing in, uh, endothelial dysfunction and inflammation, then there is that, in, that you know, background risk of uh, thrombosis. Um, we did a few other like, uh, side studies on patients in non-ICU uh, looking at their thrombotic profile. So, of course, it's very premature to say, but uh, in, in some of the patients who had COVID URTI, basically they had sore throat, running nose, but they didn't have any pneumonia. Then we, we saw actually that they did not have a hypercoagulable state. Um, they, they had very suppressed uh, fatigue levels. The, the VWF was not markedly raised, maybe about nine at most. So, obviously, there is a spectrum. And um, I mean, what we can safely say is the ICU definitely from what we've uh, found and published with these patients are hypercoagulable. For the patients that require some form of oxygen, they are hypercoagulable as well, but mm. perhaps to a less extent. And for COVID URTI, then um, that's probably a subset who are just, you know, uh, asymptomatic. The problem really is the endothelial dysfunction. So I, I can measure hypercoagulability, but I can't uh, assess the uh, endothelial dysfunction very well. And, that endothelial dysfunction may carry on uh, even post discharge, and may somehow lead to, uh, you know, ch chronic uh, arterial vascular disease, accelerated arteriosclerosis, and and may in the end culminate in in the arterial event. Do you suppose the uh, uh, the degree of inflammation or uh, inflammatory response can be a surrogate marker for the presence of endothelial dysfunction? Mm -hmm. Just, just possibly. Yeah, I, I, I think like basic markers like CRP. Once again, this is non-evidence based, but what, what we sort of anecdotally find is that if the CRP is flat and they have you know COVID URTI, but they're quite well otherwise, they are hydrating themselves well, ambulatory, then um, you know on assessment you know we don't find uh, features of hypercoagulability uh, in, in the blood test that we've done, including the global hemostatic test of mm -hmm. TEG as well as clot reform. So. Yeah, so for NUH, uh, somewhere around in June, there is a, a guide that we have for managing pre-ICU COVID-19 patients. So these are the chaps who are in general ward, they're basically quite well, not using oxygen. So we have, uh, we use the Padua to actually risk stratify them. Those who are high risk, we put them on standard low molecular weight heparin. Those who are low, who are low risk, we ask them to go to, to ambulate and around. However, if they are of high, or if they are unexplained tachycardia, or they are desatur or they desaturate on exercising, or when their pulse oximeter just maintains around 92 to 93 percent, we actually start to use a D-dimer uh, to actually try and risk stratify them. Uh, looking back right now and looking at the more and more evidence that came about, is that right or wrong? Most probably that is not correct, but that is how we did it in, 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 in then. And then based on the D-dimer, we actually prophylax them or we actually go and do and search for actually a PE or DVT in these patients. So that is the initial days around June, but I think that uh, with a national consensus guidelines coming up, that will change with more information available as well. Okay, um, does uh, Dr. Ravi have any questions? Uh, no, no, nothing to add, no, no point. Like I think we have discussed uh, very, very interesting case discussions and uh, the suggestions and as Dr. Ensu is saying, the guidelines which are about to be released will also help us to understand this uh, topic much better because they are, they are based on the local, local context. So, I can hear an echo in my voice, or oh, I think there was a technical error. So I think th th those guidelines will really help us. And uh, let's see what new data comes. So, uh, for example, uh, there is a big study which is happening uh, with uh, Lord Ajay Kakar also in UK. It has been started, and most probably it will be released somewhere next year. So maybe uh, I think everybody is trying to generate good data along this topic so that these strategies are 
individualized but also optimal so i think that's the that's the summary from our side yeah so we look forward for more data but of course this topic will remain revolving for a long time till we reach to those conclusions like the topic of vte <laughs> so um we have about five minutes left i'm just going to end off with a couple more questions if you don't mind um so shifting gears to bleeding uh, i'm just wondering if uh, uh, our hematologists have any advice on um, some potential like predictors uh, who's at risk of of bleeding um, in the patient in our patients that uh, before i mean either before or after we start them on chemo chemo trauma prophylaxis because we have seen uh, quite a fair number of patients with uh, bleeding complications even more so than than those with uh, thrombotic complications um i think just going back to our local data again um i think the predictors can't really find we can't find any uh, prognostic factors that actually predicted for for bleeding and that's the difficulty but ECMO is definitely one of them uh, which mm. is not surprising mm. uh, age is also one of the other predictors as well but these are all the standard predictors age renal failure liver failure but in our population i think because it's too small we only have 100 over patients it's not possible to find any possible predictors so i think it's very difficult and that's why the caution it should be there um, to see who do we and prophylax and who do we not uh, i think if you if you know who to start with and if they bleed well in a way we try to do first do no harm and then because if you know exactly if you can justify it in starting then you wouldn't instead of just going blunder bus for everybody maybe that may be a more logical way of starting trauma mm -hmm. prophylaxis yeah. yeah i agree you think so um just to just add on um about the bleeding uh in patients if you think about the second case the patient with the catastrophic ich his, his actually clotting profile is fairly good so the hemostatic profile is obviously not ideal but he, he managed to form a fair amount of clot uh, both on the, the TG as well as clot waveform but then again the main reason why he bled was actually local you know, organ uh, dysfunction la. so basically we think he had some kind of uh, microhemorrhage or some kind of bleed that persisted and finally catastrophically bled and we, we looked at our patients in ICU who actually bled um, a lot of them had GI bleeding and it's interesting because the, the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus actually also has um, affinity to um, the, uh, you know, uh, ACE receptors on the endothelium in the GI tract. And so, uh, I mean, it, uh, gastroenterologists have found, and, and we also do, of course, you know, um, COVID-PCR from stool and that, that, that the virus was actually found in stool as well. So I think we postulate and also we found uh, certain patients who've had bleeding ulcers. So um, essentially mostly peptic ulcer. Sometimes it's due to uh, uh, trauma from the NG tube insertion, but also colitis as well. And, and unfortunately, we're not able to actually stain for the, uh, the COVID-19, uh, the SARS-CoV virus. But we, we do think that um, there is some element of local organ attack and damage uh, by the virus and while systemically they don't yeah, they're not on a bleeding profile uh, but local organ uh, sites can bleed and, and we have seen those bleeding in ICU setting. So I'm very glad both of you mentioned ECMO because that's my last question to the both of you. Um, I mean obviously COVID um, there's, a, there's always a chance that your patient is going to end up on ECMO and just wondering what your thoughts are on the agent the optimal agent, the preferred agent that you would start, whether it's going to be UFH or LNWH uh, for anticoagulation, and how are you going to monitor, and what's your strategy? Do you start at a full dose right away, or should you um, start low and escalate slowly, given you know, we've had several complications uh, for, of bleeding complications uh, of our patients who have been on ECMO? Thanks, Jensen. I think the, the, the experience in NCID has been the patients with on ECMO bleed, but they also thrombose. So um, for some of the patients that we treated, uh, they, they later developed DVT as well. So it is essentially a hematologist nightmare like, because there's bleeding and both thrombosis and they're both high risk. And they're also both, I mean, they're all critically ill. So with regards to how to therapeutically uh, anticoagulate, usually the drug of choice is heparin, although I think in some 
uh, guidelines, they, they recommend low molecular weight heparin. Uh, but the point about giving uh, unpassionate heparin is really quick reversal in case the patient, say, develops a sudden pneumothorax and a chest tube needs to be inserted, you can quickly stop the heparin, reverse it, and, and do the procedure, whereas the low molecular weight heparin has a longer half-life. Um, the, the real question also is that what is the therapeutic range in which the anti tna level should be at? And we grapple with this, you know, with, with our patients. And uh, because we, we lost two patients, the second patient who had bleed, we actually aimed for a second uh, lower uh, anti tna threshold of 0.3 to 0.5. And the recommendation is actually 0.3 to 0.7. Um, you have to look at the data and the case series that are published. So if, if you look at the French studies, they have uh, shown a lot of patients on ECMO who've had a lot of thrombosis. And so they recommend a, a higher threshold. They say, oh, we, we prefer, uh, we recommend leaning towards a higher threshold uh, between 0.3 to 0.7, lean towards more than 0.7. And, and if you look at other studies where they're more conservative, you know, they aim for like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, sort of any tiny level, you see, a lot more um, thrombosis, whereas those who had a higher threshold had lots of bleeding. So, it, I mean, I think there's no right answer and, and really care has to be individualized. Um, but in our local context, I think the um, intensivists were leaning towards a, a slightly lower uh, range given our, our bleeding history. Okay, so for, from, for me, my experience with ECMO is uh, very limited because as you know, in NUH, uh, it's taken, uh, Graham McLaren is here, so he's the ECMO expert. So he manages and usually uses ACT, or they use a PT, PTT to guide him. Uh, so there haven't been a move to moving towards NT10A for monitoring. And so far, I, the ECMO patients in NUH, thankfully, we didn't have the kind of bleeding complications that we had. I think we were just very, very lucky. We did have a case of PE after the patient went off after ECMO, but I think so far, because I think the, the evidence is limited and I think we're just plain lucky in the things that good outcome came out from our ECMO patients with COVID-19. Okay, thanks very much, both of you. Um, I think it has been a very, very good discussion um, and excellent presentations from our panelists. Um, so I think that's, that's it. Uh, that's all the time we have. And I just want to thank once again, um, Dr. Eugene Fan and Dr. Yap Eng Su for joining us today and um, shedding so much light on the issue of anticoagulation and thrombosis in COVID-19 patients. Um, and also to thank Sanofi for very kindly sponsoring this track and supporting the EPICS 2020 conference. And to all of you, um, all the delegates, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.